everybody. How we doing? All right, so today is Super Bowl Sunday. Yeah. All right, now how many of you are for the Carolina Panthers? Okay, okay. How many of you are for the Denver Broncos? How many of you don't even care? <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, that, that's where most of us lie. Okay. Well, um, for those of you who do care, I care too because I love football. All right. So, and if you guys didn't know this, this weekend is the 30th anniversary of the 1985 Chicago Bears amazing season. Yeah, come on. Refrigerator Perry, Super Bowl Shuffle, Walter Payton, Sweetness, Jim McMahon, Richard Dent, MVP of the Super Bowl. Come on. And, well, nobody. Yeah, you guys aren't, okay, thank you. My Chicagoans are excited. But listen, I love football, and I love the Chicago Bears. And so every time those, I get resentful for everybody else that's in the Super Bowl, so I don't care. <laughs> All right, we're in a new series called Love Is. And um, so th the great, great news is, is there's a lot of things that we love. We love, or at least I do. I love football. Uh, I love Taco Bell. I love pizza. Yeah. Uh, I love my wife, Adrian. Okay, I love my sons. Uh, the problem is, uh, you know the, you kind of vary the level of the power of the word love based on the object of my affection. And there's something wrong with that. Because what happens is when you only have one l word to describe everything, it makes everything not that awesome. And so, in fact, um, that's what I wanted to get into this morning. In fact, uh, you guys remember this. Do uh, you guys remember Valentine's Day at your school, like when you were in first grade? How many of you guys remember that? All right, is, maybe this still happens. First graders are still here. You can kind of give me a nod. Uh, is, is what you would do is that you would have like a, like a wall of things, and would, everyone had like a little bag on it. Do you guys remember this? And you decorate your bag, okay, and kind of like how awesome your bag, if you got like best bag award, right, you could decorate your bag, and it's like put Valentine's here, right? And so the goal of Valentine's Day at school was to get the most Valentines. And as a guy, it was about winning. Right? I mean, like, this, there, was, there was no reason of doing anything if there wasn't a winner at the end. It's like, so how do you play this game and how do you win? That's kind of how, that's what everything revolves around. And so kind of the goal was to get the most Valentines. And so you'd have to coerce a couple people to put a couple extra in. You know, you'd, persuade, you know, you'd go to the, you know, some people like, hey, <clears throat> I'll put a Valentine in yours. You put a Valentine. You know, you'd you'd be politicking the deal. You guys, you gotta get the most Valentines. And listen, even if you, even if you were, um, you didn't really care who got the most, you just want anyone to have more than you. And that's how we operate. And so we sort of love, or we sort of learn that love is a little bit of a competition. All right, it is all about how much you can get. And uh, you know, it's not like culture changes all of a sudden. It's, no, no, it's about just give it away. Like, that never changes. It's all about get yours get mine. I want to like have this thing in me that says I need more. Why? Because in our heart, listen, in our heart, we're designed for love. We're designed for it. And so we crave it. And it's the thing that's always missing. Now, so this morning, um, we're going to do something because I wanted to show a quick scripture up here of what Jesus said. He, he said, by this, people, all people, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Well, it couldn't possibly be meaning like that kind of love where you're trying to get all the Valentines. What does he mean? And so uh, this morning, we're going we're to talk about what, or we're on a four-part series called Love Is, and week one, we're going to talk about what love is not. All right, so, you know, sometimes to describe something, it's easier to describe it in, what, in terms of what it isn't. And then next week, we're going to talk about what love is, and then uh, we're going to talk about what love does, and then we're going to talk about how love lasts. So, like, if you're, like, you just came here for the very first time, and it's your first week, just hang with us for four weeks. We're talking about love. Whether you're single or married, this is the exact place for you, because we're going to talk about how we are called to love one another. All right. And so um, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Like, for some of you, you had this read at your wedding. How many of you guys had this read at your wedding? 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. Oh, okay. Wow, a lot. All right, and so um, you probably thought it was like, Paul, like, and Paul was the writer, like, Paul, um, can you come up with love? We're going to do a love ballad, and we need something for weddings. Can you come up for something with us? And he's like, well, you know, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have, no, have not love, I am just a noisy gong or a clashing cymbal. 
That's not what it is, okay? Uh, he, he didn't just come up with this out of nowhere. 1 Corinthians 13 has 12 chapters preceding it. And uh, this is a letter that Paul wrote to a really awesome yet messed up church. Um, it's in the city of Corinth. And if you don't know where Corinth is, it's, it's Greece. And you know the little chunk, you know, like, Cor like Greece looks like a boot. And like there's that one little teeny part that's like the ankle. Like Corinth is the ankle. And it's about four miles wide. And it connects the northern part of Greece to the southern part of Greece. And about 146 BC, there was a little bit of a rebellion in Corinth. And so uh, Rome leveled the place. Like leveled it to the ground. Nothing left. Nobody lived there for a hundred years. And then around 46 BC, they're like, uh, uh, Caesar's like, you know, man, this place that connects the north to south, we could make some money there. Let's get this thing churning up. And so next thing you know, all, all the, the creatives of the world, all the, the tech people, all the business people, all the people that were going to make it started moving into Corinth. And this became the, think New York City. A little, there's nobody that's from, or, or you think Austin. Like there's nobody. How many of you actually are born in Austin? Like 15, okay? So like the rest of us, we moved here. So it's sort of the same thing, right? So you came here to make it. You came here for college. You came here uh, to start your career. Uh, you don't, you didn't necessarily think here, I'm just going to just, I just was born here and I just want to live and just enjoy cattle. Like, so nobody was thinking like that. And so that's very much the way Corinth was. And so what comes with brilliant people is brilliant problems. And so they were, you know, they were really gifted people and gifted people want to be number one. And so they were constantly fighting one another. They were constantly comparing gifts, con constantly like, oh yeah, you did this? Well, I did this. And so Paul is so frustrated, he writes this chapter sort of out of frustration of like, you guys don't get it! And this is what we read at our weddings, which actually is very fitting. All right, so, um, <laughs> so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 13. If you don't have a Bible, I want you to raise your hand in the air, wave it like you do care, and a Bible will come to you. And if you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. And if you forgot yours today, use our Bible. We love that. And then just leave it on the chair when you're done. So we're in 1 Corinthians 13 is on page 959, and the Bibles are passing out. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Here we go. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, just so you kind of get the, the reality, the, 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 the gong or cymbal was sort of like what you would, you know, bong, and then that let everybody know it was time to worship. It had one purpose, just to make noise, and that was kind of like your alert. Hey, everyone come and worship at the uh, Temple of Demeter. It, this was a, this is sort of what you did. But it had, but what Paul's point was here is like, these were super gifted people. Not only were they eloquent, but some of them had like the gift of speaking tongues. Like they could like hear something from God and, then, and they'd speak in one tongue and the next thing you know, someone else would come interpret it and like, yo, I just spoke from God. What do you got? And so it was like this like competition. And so then ultimately, Paul's like, what is wrong with you people? It's not about speaking in tongues or being super eloquent. So here it is. Love, if you didn't know this, is not eloquence alone. Like, if you can speak of the language of men and of angels, but you have not love, you are just a noise. All right, so I'm about to confess a story to you, all right? So don't judge me. And I don't think I've told this one to Adrian yet, so you can kind of watch your face to kind of hear this go. All right, so when I was single back in my early 20s, all right? So single people in your early 20s, like, I remember being you, all right? And I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, and so I had this great idea. So I thought, what if I got mad? Okay, so I, I did the what if, and then I went to Walmart. And do you guys, you know the little trifold things that are like used for science fair projects? They're like this big. So I bought 20 of them. Then I brought them home and I wrote poems like, sweet love, like, when I look into your eyes, I see my soul and where it lies. There's nothing I would rather be, nowhere I'd rather, nothing I'd rather do than just be sitting here with you. And something like that. And, uh, and I wrote that, and I printed off 20 copies of that, okay? <laughs> I put 20 copies of that poem, and I put it, like, right here. Okay. Then I wrote another one, like, I just want to be near, want to be close, and so I have no fear. When I touch your hand, there's something in this man that gets bigger and stronger, and I want to be just so much closer to you. All right, and so then I took that one, and I put it right here, and I wrote, like, 20 of these things. Put them all over, and remember, I bought 20. So all you have to do is print. It was mass texting before there was mass texting. 
print out, hit print 20 times, plaster them all over this thing, and then I got these massive envelopes, and then I had like, it wasn't like a Rolodex, it was like a little magnetic thing that I had in my wallet that expanded with all the girls' addresses. And then I sent all, all these girls these letters, right? And, but, or like massive things, and they would come, they actually came in the mail. It cost like 12.50 to send one of them, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and so, okay, and then, and then, for the ones that didn't have their address, I just would take them to their house. Hey, I just wanted to give you this, because, you know, it's Valentine's, and heard you didn't have one. Okay, so then, like, they, they're just like, like, we, it's not like we're friends, or like we talk, we just kind of met once. <laughs> <laughs> and they open this thing, right? And I'm like, no, no, read it. Uh, some of you are hating me right now. It's okay. And then uh, they're like, and I'll never forget this. This girl starts crying. And I'm like, oh, gosh, what did I do? And I'm like, hey, um, so I'll see you later. <laughs> All right, and so, and I walk out. And I'm, I'm like, because what was that? Now, let's, what was Was that love? All right, so this is me going back to my, you know, 20-something-year-old self being like, you're a moron, right? All right, so like, then what was I doing? You know what I was, what it was? It was like, remember, val- like, first grade, I need more Valentines. I need more tell- people tell me they like me. I want them to tell me how great I am. I want, come on, it's about me. You with me? You, you see, that's what he's saying here. If you, like, if you have incredible speech, but you don't have any love, you know what it is? Worthless. And I wonder, but here's the weird thing about it. I want you to just think about it. that. Like, I put this girl in tears just off of some random words that I wrote just for fun. Why? Because every one of us, listen, 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 it's in you. You want those words to be true. You want them. But when they come without love, it's just words. You want to know why the Bible is so powerful? It's just words. Right? Look at it. It's just words. But why has this moved so many people over the centuries? Why? Because the love that is coming through these words and it's true. And it doesn't leave a girl going like, what did you do to me? It leaves you going, wow, I am loved. You with me? Verse 2. And if I have prophetic powers, meaning like, I'm like, God gave me a revelation, and I'm like about to tell you about what's going to happen in your life and who you should marry and who you shouldn't marry. Everyone would like sign up for that. I think they have actually, it's not a show. All right, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. I've got all this wisdom. I've got all this power. I've got all this. And if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love. Now listen, listen to the way he phrases this. This is not like I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal, but it says, I am nothing. I want you to hear this. So what that means, you could be not a Christian, hear directly from God, be able to have enough faith to move mountains, but not be a Christian. How is that even possible? Well, let me give you, I'll just give you two examples from the Bible. All right, do you guys remember Balaam? Usually he's more known for his donkey. Balaam was a, was a guy that actually heard from God, like and God would talk to him. But he had no faith in him. And so he would do, he was like a prophet for hire. I mean, the most bizarre thing. And so this guy comes up and he says, I'm going to pay you all this money. He, uh, Balak's his name. He gives him all this money. He says, all right, now prophesy against Israel. He says, I, I can't, but here's what I can do for you. If you just go and entice those uh, Israelites, they fall for the, the girl thing every time. Just start bringing some girls, parade them in front of them, and then they'll lose favor with their God, and then they'll all die, and you'll defeat them. And they did. So here's a guy who had ability to have prophetic knowledge from God and have the ability to do miracles, but had no relationship with God. He didn't have any love. You know who's another guy who did that? Matthew 10. One of your guys' favorite guys. Judas. Judas healed people with the power of God. Now think about that. Healed people with God's power, used by God, but didn't have love. Because what was he in it for? The power. He wanted power for power's sake. He needed more valentines in his bag. Come on, come on, everybody. I'm going to do a miracle, everybody. Here we go. Boom! What do you think about that one? Pretty good, right? Huh? See, that's the problem. That's the problem. That's why, like, a show of force or 
power doesn't change hearts. You guys know this. Love is not power alone. And here's, here's what Jesus said about this. this is, I love when Jesus kind of steps into this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Like Judas called him Lord all the time. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many would say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Like we had like real prophecies and like stuff happened. And didn't we cast out demons in your name and do mighty works? Like we healed people. We fed people in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Because when you don't have love, you're missing something very vital to this equation. And that's a problem. I, but here's the reality. Because here's, here's what's cool about this. Um, because think of it, o- if only Christians could, could do, do like counseling or therapy or could do anything good. It'd be, man, we'd be outnumbered and it'd be a really dark place. I mean, in fact, here's, here's something that's pretty funny. Because all truth is God's truth. In fact, one of my favorite marriage counseling books, uh, probably the best one that everybody who does marriage counseling kind of reveres, is called The Marriage Clinic by a guy named John Gottman, who is Jewish and divorced. But he's got the best stuff. I'm just saying. Right, so here's right. You don't actually have to follow what God has sort of revealed. To, that doesn't make it any less true. It just means that you don't have his love. Do you see that? You don't have to be a Christian to do amazing works for God. And that's why we always got to ask, what, why are the amazing? Because this is where, what happens ultimately. Is that we'll start to manipulate people with acts. In fact, when, isn't it true, isn't it true that a person that, uh, is that, that you can force somebody to do something? For example, um, let's just take empires, rise and fall. Just, you know, pick your favorite tyrant. And um, you'll find that they conquer by force, not love. In fact, here's a great quote. I love this quote. This is from Napoleon and not Napoleon Dynamite. All right, so Napoleon Bonaparte. All right, so he was an emperor. For those of you guys who, like, need some history help. Uh, and he conquered, like, Europe. And this is what he said. I'm not saying this guy was a Christian, probably far from it, but he knew Christ from a knowledge standpoint. This is what he said. I know men. And I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and I have founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Now, I want to highlight this next part. Jesus Christ founded his empire upon love. And at this hour, millions would die for him. You see, this is power. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about it. Think about the, where I go with this is power isn't the only thing that's going to change a heart. Like, this is why um, Lex Luthor and all your Superman movies— all right? He doesn't get a heart change because Superman has more power than him. All right, let's just go to real life. When we go to prison ministry, when we go to prison ministry, when there is no heart change, then you know what happens to criminals? They get harder. And instead of when they get out, like, I'm going to be a good citizen, what do they do? They think of ways to not get caught. Right? Isn't, isn't that the one thing as a parent you don't want your kid to do, just kind of get defeated? And by the, you know, once they kind of get out from under your sight, they're just going to go back to doing their own doing and not get caught this time. Isn't that true? You see, what Jesus does is something more powerful. And, and this is why you become a Christian. I don't, I don't want to say it. It's because of his kindness. In fact, God's word says, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. But for some reason, listen to me, for some reason, we want to control and force people to change. Don't you see that in your marriage? We'll talk more about that in a second. Next verse. If I gave away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, so if I take a vow of poverty, like I'm just going to be poor for the rest of my life, I'm, gonna, I'm no longer a shopper for marshals, I'm out at Salvation Army's thrift store, that's where I'm going. And you start judging everybody who doesn't shop there. And if I deliver up my body to be burned, if I become a martyr, and I have not love. I gain nothing. You get no reward for the vow of poverty when it's all about everyone going, oh, uh-huh. you're so good. You are so good. Look at you. You are, 
you drive a cruddy car and you have cruddy clothes and you just, man, I wish, man, you're awesome. And what's that person doing? Thank you for my Valentine. That's all that is. That you, you got your reward. Congratulations. You feel good about yourself. Or if I deliver my body to be burned. And, and that is a sacrifice. But listen, love is not sacrifice alone. And here's, this is why, this is Jesus. Listen, listen to what Jesus said. Or rather what G- Paul wrote about Jesus. But God demonstrates his love for us that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. So here's, here's what Jesus does. He dies on the cross. Listen to me. He dies on the cross not as a contractual obligation so that you have to go die on a cross. He's like, look what I did. Now you do it too. He dies in your place out of love. Now, here it is. Because you're a sinner and because you've sinned, there is there's eternal separation from God for you. That's like hell. And so Jesus comes. He dies on the cross for your sin. Isn't that great news? And then he offers you. He said, hey, I want you to take this free gift. Come on. It's all yours for free. You don't have to do anything with it. Just own this freedom and love people like I love you. Pay it forward. And that is what makes Christianity different from pretty much any other religion because it's all about this love that we've been given. Now, I want to I take this. I want to show you these three verses from a different perspective. Eloquence minus love is what? Manipulation. You see that? You see that? A lot of us are really good at using our words. Couples, right? Couples, look at this. You're good at using your words, and you can get whatever you want because you're just your flat-out better arguer. You're just better at it. But when you don't have love with your words, it's manipulation. Okay, single people. Where are my single people at? There you go. All right. <laughs> when you text her or him at midnight, and all, and there's no commitment in this relationship. In fact, you're using that text as an emotional crutch because you need the words. You need the Valentines in your bag because you're so empty. But there's no commitment. It's just all about absorbing and sucking it in, right? Or this is what happened back in the day. Like, no, no, you hang up first. No, no, you hang up first. That's what that was. It was like, I'm going to use you as my emotional crutch because I need it right now. And I, I, there's something in me that longs for something more. And you're the best I've got right now. And, but, you know, you've got financial issues and you've got a whole bunch of other issues I don't really want to deal with. And I want to really spend the rest of my life with you. But I'll take you for this amount of time because it's feeding my emotional crutch need. Does that sting a little bit? Awkward, right? You're like, oh, I'm not going to have to. All right, so, but that's what we do. That's called using somebody for the words that they're going to give you that makes you feel good for the moment and puts another valentine in your bag, but it's, it's so fleeting. That's why you need to kind of broaden your horizon. You send 20 cards out or 20 texts out so that you can never feel alone. We get really, really busy with a lot of words from a lot of people, so we don't have to have that feeling. Single people, am I right? Come on. All right, so, okay, so that's that first one, all right? So the eloquence without love is manipulation. How about this one? Power without love is manipulation. Some might call it tyranny or abuse. How many relationships do we know of that there's a lot of um, talking in really loud voices and it's not love? Because if I can talk louder, you'll shut up. I'm going to use my power to shut your mouth because you're talking. And that needs to end. So, that's manipulation. In case you were wondering what that was. <laughs> That's what we do, though, right? Because, okay, okay, how about this? Maybe you don't do the loud screaming. But this is what's going on in a lot of relationships right now. Power without love is mani- manipulation. What's going on? It's called control. It's called control. I need my Valentine's. I need to feel secure, so you have to act a certain way. You... I need to parent you. And I've got to keep you in line. I've got to keep you in check. Hey, are you drinking again? I got to, you, let me see your phone. Let me look at your phone. It's called parenting. That's what parents do. You're trying to control them. You're going to like, you're going to do what you're told. And you know what? Not only is that manipulative to your spouse, it's exhausting. 
And no wonder you're not happy. No wonder you're so fed up and tired and you're like, oh, I got, you've got this extra job of parenting your spouse. But that's not, there's no love in that. Power minus love is manipulation. You guys are clear on that, right? This, this isn't like new stuff. But, and the problem with that is it leads us to a place where we resent our spouse and we have no love. We resent the very person that we've said all these sweet things at and we had this verses read at. And yet we don't want to, well, I mean, we've, we've had it read at the wedding, but I mean, I mean, life happens. No, 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 no. You, listen, they will know we are Christians by our power grabs and by our eloquence. They're going to know we are Christians by our love. And you know what you're afraid of? Some of you are afraid that you're just going to be a doormat. Well, if I, if I let her get away with that, just saying. If, if I let her get away with it, then she'll just keep doing it. And so I got I to gotta put some rails on here because I got to get my voice amped up. That's not love. Okay, how about, how about this last one? Sacrifice minus love equals, guess what? Manipulation. Okay? You guys know this? So, like, when you are, when you do your thing, all right, and then you compare yourself. Here's what people that are sacrificed without love, they, they, they will take a vow of poverty, and they're only going to buy from the thrift store, and then they judge every other person that goes to Marshall's, or Neiman Marcus, or wherever. And they're going to be like, oh, and, and so this happens a lot. So, how much you pay for that shirt? Oh, $100. <laughs> 15 cents. Oh, you're one of those. Right? I mean, that's, that the reality is it's like this pure judgment. And what you're doing is you want more Valentines. You want to be like, we want more credit from people. It's about me. Tell me how great I am. Tell me, how, tell me my clothes are really cruddy and I'll feel really good about it. Because I'm going to be really holy. God's going to reward me. Brother, you already got your reward. All right. How about this? How about this? In some of us, in some of us we are serving our church or we, we've taken up some cause and that service is like it becomes a sacrifice and we're giving up time, we're giving up money, and then when nobody else gets on board, we get angry. You don't care! I mean, listen, I get about dot eight, I don't care, like the church doesn't care about anything from, I could just go a litany of lists, but I get it every week. Of all the stuff we don't care about, and it's everybody really angry about all the stuff we don't care about. And what it is, it's a person who's hurting so bad because they want some freaking credit. Give me some credit. And if, it, listen, if you've ever been burnt out of the church, this is why. This is why you get burnt out. You had sacrifice without love, and then you used to manipulate people to do what you wanted. Get on board with my ministry! Get on board with my thing! Don't you care? I'm so burnt out! And the reason you're burnt out is there's been no prayer, there's been no connection with God. This is, this is how I know this happens because, well, I may or may not have been participating in that kind of thing for a while. So I was in the Army, all right? I was in the Army. In the Army, like, you shame people who sleep more than five hours. Like, and l so every morning at PT, physical training, you, uh, you know, the worse somebody looked, you'd be like, whoa, that guy's pretty awesome. And so you'd see that guy, and everyone kind of, like, part the way because you didn't want to be asked, like, how much you slept. Because he'd be like, how much you sleep? I've got about six. <laughs> Two. What's up? I mean, that was just like, you'd sleep shame people to death. I mean, it was, it was hilarious. Now, now, listen, when I got out of the army, I didn't know that wasn't a thing. <laughs> okay, don't, stop judging me, all right? So, like this, so I go to work at a ministry, like a ministry, like there's girls there. I hadn't worked with girls before. Okay, so this girl walks in, and she's, she's like in her late 20s, single, single girl, really pretty, and she looks just exhausted. And I go, you know what? She needs a compliment. <laughs> Allison, you look terrible. I mean, bags under your eyes. Man, how much sleep did you get? And she's just like, Well, great work. Doing a good job. <laughs> no kidding. And then the next day I see her again. She looks like worse. And I'm like, whoa! 
you are like exhausted. I mean, it's written all over your face. What's wrong? And then this other girl from behind is like, how? I mean, I got like read the riot act. I'm like, what do I do? I was just telling her that like she's exhausted. <laughs> Apparently it's not a thing. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. When you come up to somebody and your whole point is to kind of mention your sacrifice so they'll go like, okay, you ready? Here it is. If, if I do this to my sons, because we're in parenting, this is where we, this is we're guilty of this. Ready? Um, so Jet isn't exactly a great sleep right now. It's my son Jet. Sweet name. I know you're thinking, wow, that's an awesome name. Taken. All right. So uh, my son Jet will scream at like 3 in the morning, and I'll like get up, and I'll, I'll go, and I'll you know pick him up out of the crib, and I'll start rocking him. And I bill at about $25 an hour minimum. And if I just hold, I'm like, okay, that's 30 minutes. That's an hour. And then when he's 18, I give him a bill. No, no, I sacrifice. You owe me. He would be like, uh, Dad, you're kind of weird. But isn't that what we do? We do this to our children all the time. We tell them how much we sacrificed and how much. Do you know what I've done for you? And they can't comprehend it because they don't have kids. They have no clue what that even means. All right? So, so that's why they're like, they don't know. And so when you treat them like they, had, it's, they owe you something because of the love you gave them, then sacrifice without love is just manipulating them to do what you want them to do without the love. Now listen, listen. It's, remember, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Do you hear that? God's kindness leads us to repentance. So you, can, you may have the greatest words. You might be an incredible arguer, but when you don't have love, you're manipulating Someone needs to write that down. Like, okay, I'm manipulating. When you use your volume, when you use your power, when you use your uh, force, like you use your parenting controls on your spouse and you have no love, that's manipulation. When you use words, because you need to feel good. And there's no love or there's no commitment, there's nothing there. That's manipulation you have the sacrifice that you want to kind of hold everybody over everybody's head and there is no love that is manipulation that's what it is so this morning um i have a question for you kind of in light of this and this isn't just like this came up new like back in hosea 6 6 god wrote through hosea i desire steadfast love not sacrifice don't manipulate people so the question I have is, have you confused manipulation for love? Because isn't it true? Commitment without love is misery. I'm committed to the marriage! Oh, well, yay. That's so romantic. I love you. I don't want one more worse day with you. That's way better. We need that. His love says, Love is different than manipulation. Manipulation tries to control the environment, whereas love is a force that changes a heart. And that's where we need to start. And so this morning, uh, the first question I have is, first, have you confused manipulation for love? And maybe you're trying to manipulate God. You're like, hey, listen, God, I've been doing a lot of great stuff. Look at all I've been doing. You should be loving me a lot more than you have because of the things I've been doing. And boy, that's exhausting. I mean, it's, you, you're constantly trying to work and prove and stick more Valentines in to kind of say, look at all my Valentines. See, I'm worth something. And what you really need is just accept what Jesus has done for you because he loves you. And he sent his son. He sent his son to die. God demonstrated his love for us in this, that when you had nothing to give, he died for you. No contract. No commitments. It was better than Verizon. Listen, listen. He died for you without you having to do anything. He kind of lays it out there. This is the kind of love that you're entering into. And why, for some reason, do we try and take that love and put people in love contracts? I'll do this if you service me properly. I'll love you, but you got to earn it. That's not how Jesus loves you. 
why are we trying to love others like that? You're like, Chris, no, no, you don't understand. You, you don't understand who I'm living with. But I understand who died for you. Who rose from the dead, who conquered death in the grave, and who is desperately saying, this is how you do it. You're doing it wrong. You're manipulating. You're not loving. And so I want you to accept the free gift of grace. Amazing grace. It's beautiful. And I want you to jump into this relationship with Jesus. And then secondly, for those of you who are in relationships or even single and you're using manipulation as opposed to love, because that's all you know. Listen, if, if, if you grew up and you're now 30 years old and your whole life you were taught manipulation or maybe you were abused and that's all you know. If you've been abused, all you know what to do is abuse. And we need to learn that that's not love. You were talked to and talked down at, and then all of a sudden you repeat it because that's all you know. And so listen, if you're married to somebody like that, it's going to take time for them to unlearn the darkness of their heart that's been programmed as they learn what love is. And there's a period of time where Christ has to wrap their heart up. And you've got to trust Jesus and not trust your control. You hear me? You trust Jesus, not how you can control him. Because that's not what Jesus is. This, this morning, um, you're going to have an opportunity. If your marriage is like in a train wreck zone, um, Robert Sass, where are you at? Robert's right back there, and he's going to be in the back signing up people for something we're calling re-engage. It's like your marriage, you know, it's like you're not going to be like, hey, you're done faking. Like, you know how you have the argument before you get out, and then you put your smiley faces on when you come in here, and you're kind of like beyond that. I don't even care anymore. Who knows? That's when you're ready to go. All right, so I want you to go see Robert. Say, like, I don't care. I don't care who knows that we have issues. Because no one's going to judge you for that. Did you know that? Like, we love it when people go, hey, I got issues. Awesome. Welcome to healing. Welcome to hope. Welcome to a, a life where then you can turn around and help somebody else who is walking through that similar horrific moment in their life. So we're going to be starting that next week, next Wednesday, uh, at 7 p.m. I want you to sign up in the back. Would you guys pray with me? Father, you sent your son who knew no sin, become sin on our behalf so that we might be the righteousness of God. And Father, we thank you for that. We worship you for that. And God, I'm praying that somebody here would stop trying to manipulate even you with all the things that they've done by their maybe amazing prayers, their amazing words, the way they can flap their gums and people are like, oh, they must be a Christian, so I'll stop asking them. God, I pray that, that by their amazing things they've seen you do and they can tell stories about it. And maybe they've even sacrificed, taken vows of poverty, and they're like a martyr, God. But they don't have you. Would you open up their hearts so they could see how desperately they need a Savior, and they need love. Father, uh, would you do that thing that you do? Would you open up a heart and you make it brand new? God, for our singles that are they're just young they're dumb they made a lot of decisions I made would you help them not make those same decisions God would you help them see that eloquence isn't love that eloquence without love is manipulation would you help them to see that how they can use people for their own emotional crutch don't make them spend 10 years learning that lesson over and over again like I had to God, I'm praying for our couples, our married couples, God, that are constantly trying to control one another, using power grabs, leverage to make the other person do what they're supposed to do. Father, please, would you show them that that's not love, that's manipulation. God, I'm praying that wherever we're at as Christians, we would take the next step get rid of the ways we manipulate and take on the ways that we love. The way that you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Imagine what would happen, just for a moment, if we stopped trying to manipulate people into doing what we want them to do and simply, simply loved. I know it's a big risk. It's a huge risk. It's a faith risk that love will really work. 
But what if it does? What if love is really that powerful? What if love could really change your own heart and change the heart of your spouse and change the heart of your singleness? What would that do? Think about how much of a whole person you would be and the way you interact with people at work and at home and at play. We would change the world because people go like, what is it that you have that you're not trying to manipulate and control? You just love me. What is that? People would not understand. And they would ask the question, what's so different about you? And you'd have to say, Jesus, love me. Would you receive the benediction? Go and be a people who let the world know about our God because by the way we love one another. Let them know by our speech that isn't manipulating. Let them know that by our work that isn't manipulating. Let them know about by our sacrifice that isn't trying to get us something and manipulate them to something else. God, move in us. Let us be the light in the darkness. And let us love one another with your power as we push back the darkness. And have an awesome week of worship. <laughs>